Eric Adol and Ethan Vanderen, Oscar nominees for the first Quiet Place who are supervising sound editors for Quiet Place Part 2. I, I love the opening of the film so much. I, it obviously takes place on the first day of the alien attack. And the opening sounds are very solo. You have the traffic light clicking up from like red to, or from green to red, excuse me. And then the car speeds in. I guess, uh, can you talk about how you guys landed on that initial mix to really kind of like throw the audience into this first day? Well, yeah. Uh, so yeah, the opening of the film was, uh, was very fun. And, and to me, it kind of reflects... Um, what I think of as, as sort of the magic of sound design. Um, it can really twist your expectations and flip them on your head. And for anybody who'd seen the first film coming into part two, they'd think, okay, now we're, we're back into this, um, this universe where sound is deadly, where any sound you make could be a matter of life and death. And so we start in what seems like this abandoned town with just a little bit of wind flapping a flag in the distance and um, this street light that's creaking in the wind and you hear the little tick of one light turned to the next. And then vroom, there's this big truck engine and John Krasinski's character, um, you know, the Abbott patriarch pulls in and you realize, oh, this actually takes place before the first film. And what I love is it's kind of flipping expectations on its head. And that, that was John's idea to start the film that way. Um, but what I, I really like about the opening is it's kind of then a slow burn because there's this tension of what you know is about to happen. And we're following the routine uh, of this character, Lee Abbott, uh, going to the grocery store, you know, yanking the plastic wrapper to bag his oranges and these very specific sounds that in the first movie would be deaf are too loud. Um, they just kind of pile up one by one. And, you know, he walks to the little league game and there's a dog barking at something. You don't know what it is, but the dog has this premonition. And it's kind of like this day in the life where we're just playing the reality of this town and this situation with, with no music. And uh, then Little Lead Game starts and which um, Michael Borowski, the production sound mixer did an incredible job collecting all these voices and another dog at the game who also has another premonition who's barking. And that became kind of the spine of that setup. Uh, and then something strange happens in the sky and uh, that's where the film takes a turn where all this tension, this slow burn is building up to this moment and, and things change. And I, I should let you kind of continue with the- uh... Well, right, so, so, so things change and the creatures you know, start um, streaming you know, through the sky and then it's total chaos on the ground. And the beautiful thing about the chaos is it gave us a place to go, which we were, you know, were sort of craving for in the first film, in the sense that, um, you know, in the first film, we established this, this idea that um, at times in the movie, we go right into the sonic perspective of different characters, but specifically Regan, the daughter who is deaf. And of course, to live in a world where sound um, is everything, sound, you know, um, is the difference being between between surviving and not surviving. And to be, to have your hearing compromised in that universe is um, such a vulnerable place to be. Um, that you know, the idea of going right into her sonic perspective is just incredibly powerful. And so with the opening of this part two, we were able to go into her sonic perspective in the middle of this total chaos. And that provided such a sort of powerful contrast between you know, the perspective of the audience, which is the perspective of you know, all the other hearing people um, in this world and Regan's perspective, which of course is just this sort of dull, you know, muffled sort of beating, basically the sound of the blood, you know, pumping through her veins. And so that was super, you know, exciting for us to be able to, you know, right off the bat, sort of establish that, that idea 
and to take it further than we were able to go in, in part one. Yeah, it, it's really incredible. And I think what you said there about like how just the sound telling a story is so great. Like you mentioned, like the, the Little League game, I felt like, and I would love to, you guys wonder if you did this. I was like, I was getting, um, not um, like, I was getting emotional because it's so, it's such like the platonic ideal of what a Little League baseball game in a small town would sound like. And knowing that this is like the last time that's going to happen in this world, right? Because of the aliens, it just was like, it was like kind of re- re- really emotional. And I was just like, I guess, I mean, can you talk, was that something that you guys were thinking of when you were doing that mix and like making it sound like as perfect of a, a, a small town event as possible, I guess, on this last day before sound becomes this terrible thing that now is going to get people killed by aliens, basically. Absolutely. We, we really needed to create the contrast between, you know, the most idyllic kind of small town life with families and community because the flip side of that is when that community gets ripped apart. Um, And, you know, there's, you can think of the film as a metaphor for many things, including the pandemic now in in hindsight, um, (laughs) where people actually had to learn to survive in quarantine. And, and so there's, there's something to us that was very kind of uh, profound and emotional about creating that contrast. Um, I think the way John approached the script Uh, You know, of course, sound is central. It's in the DNA of this story. And he'd written it very specifically into the script. The the family has to kind of learn how to use sound in in order to survive. Um, But the thread, I think, that made it work for me, the way John approached it, was from pre-invasion to post-invasion, the connection with family is there the entire time. That's the running theme. And if we didn't have characters that we really cared about and could through sound create intimacy with, you know, it's amazing when you start to get really quiet. Um, There's this incredible effect where an audience actually starts to lean in and really open their ears and uh, uh, feel a much more intimate connection with characters. And so where we have this film, which gets so quiet and there's just little whispers and details and touches, um, there's something that, you know, to me, it creates a really strong connection between uh, the audience and the characters. And in a way, what we tried to do through the entire film was to put the audience into the shoes of the characters using sound through, as Ethan mentioned, using sonic POVs, but also just that very delicate intimacy which um sound has this this power to to be able to achieve and i guess we have to wrap up but last thing you obviously mentioned like having reagan as like the central thing i guess when you guys were is that something you talked to millicent about like how she like how did you guys find like what that would sound like for the character obviously because well actually what um millicent's um mom actually described to john um what what millie's um sort of um sense of of hearing was what it was like for her and then he described it to us and then we took his description of her experience it and we related it to to an experience that both eric and i had had which was that of being in an anechoic chamber which is a room that's completely sound isolated so you you don't hear any sound from the outside world And after about five, maybe 10 minutes of being in one of these rooms, just being there quietly by yourself, your ears start to open up to the point where you start hearing the sound of your own blood pumping through your veins and you start to hear the ringing of your own nervous system. You start to hear your own body. And so that sort of um, what we used as our inspiration for her for creating her sonic envelopes. It's incredible, yeah. Uh, Eric Adol, Ethan Vanderen, uh, Quiet Place Part Two. Thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Thank Cheers. you.